Hi there, come on in. The white bass are hitting in the Titabawassee River. Now they don't stay long, they spawn and move back out to Lake Huron, but for a two or three week period, all that fishing is as fast as you'll ever experience. We'll take you along and show you what it's like. We'll also get down to the fish's point of view in an aquarium, much like the one we're setting up at the museum in Houghton Lake, opening this weekend. Kathy Beitler has a recipe for salmon loaf. Bob Garner has outdoor headlines in his commentary. All this coming up in just a moment, so you stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. Rivers are especially good for spring fishing because of the many varieties of fish that make their annual spawning runs up the rivers. In a two to three week period, a species will be thick in a river and fairly easy to catch. What brings us to this river? Bob Garner's master angler white bass. Mounted by Doris and Keith Lutz of Captured Memories Taxidermy in Saginaw, it's on display at our hunting and fishing museum at Houghton Lake. It's my first master angler, Freddie, about two pounds, one ounce. Lots of fun. We've got to do a story on that. Lots of fish. There are lots of fish up there. I caught this one on a uh, walleye magnet. We've been using shad wraps, and Fred, you can just catch them one after the other, and they're all big fish. There are no small white bass in the Titabwasi River. They're all a pound and a half or bigger. Double. Well, should I throw back out and try for a triple? We made the trip last week. The white bass had just begun their run, and fishing was picking up. Now, this is a smaller one, but I'm getting my money's worth. There he is. We got him? This is a big one here. This is a big fish here. Is it? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's that's a good that's a that's close to two pounds there. That one's pretty close. That one's see a big belly on that one? This one. The weight of white bass in the spring is basically in the eggs they carry, not the flesh on their bones. But we kept a few of them for the table. There's lots of lures you can use for white bass, including most of the crankbaits you have in your tackle box. Since we're in a river in a relatively shallow water, you're probably not going to want a big-lipped crankbait like that one. It would dive too deeply and hang up on the bottom. A shallow diver would be more practical. You can cast near a shore like this without too much problem of getting hooked up because you can tell this bank is a steep bank and probably it, it dips right down into the water so you can cast next to the shore there's going to be quite a drop off so your lure can drop down there. Of course the fish like to hang along that drop off too but they don't like my new crankbait. There this is a good one. That's some fresh territory. There we go I had one hit. I didn't give those crankbaits much of a chance. Bob Garner and Keith Lutz were doing well with them, so I switched to ultralight tackle using a small jig and wigwag tail. Now the hook rides up on a jig, hopefully not snagging anything on the bottom. Some anglers like the tail curling towards the hook, not down away from the hook like I have it here. Well, I tried it both ways. I couldn't see much difference. Caught just as many fish. White bass don't give up easy. And when they flip out of your hand, you've got to watch it. I tell you, you got to be careful on these things. I'll give you a lesson on the sharp fins of a white bass in a minute, but let's talk about the damage that these scrappers do to lures, especially the soft plastic twister tails and those soft plastic wigwags. Another problem you run into with these twister tails after you catch a couple fish is they get torn up. So when that plastic tears, you'll never keep it on the hook right, so you can just tear it off put a new one on. You want to make sure you thread the twister tail down quite a ways on the hook. Don't, don't pop out with it too early. Thread it right down around the corner so it comes out about at the end of the, the grub portion. Push it over the tip and that's the way it should ride. So it'll ride in the water like that. And that shouldn't slide down. Great white all over, right, right in there, right in there. Right. Well, I Look will. this one. Whoa! That is a nice this one. This is the nicest one of the day. Right here. This is the nicest one of the day. Yep, I just had a hit. 
Another yeah, one. right up in there, there's a whole bunch of them right there. Whoa, he's got one. I don't think this is as big as yours, but... I thought I might as well try a technique that Bing <laughs> McClellan taught me with smallmouth bass, lifting them underneath the belly, which paralyzes smallmouths and largemouths. But would it work on white bass? They settle right down. Isn't that amazing? Now for the lesson on fins. I name one of them wrong. Do you know which one? Oh, little one. When you're uh, holding a white bass, you got to really be careful because of the spines. They have them on almost every fin. Here on this back dorsal fin, there's a spine that comes down right there. If you can see that, you can catch your fingers on that one. Of course, all of these dorsal spines, I let those up, all of those can really cut your fingers, so you push those down. The anal fin has spines on it right at the back, and every time this flips, boy, you can cut yourself just as they slide through your hands. But the even the pectoral fins here, it's going to be tough to show you these. But right here, these pectoral fins have spines. Not only that, the gill covers right there, you see that edge on the gill cover? Those are sharp all along there. So when you handle these white bass, as they flip around, you got to watch all of the spines on all of the fins. Now, the pelvic fin is on the bottom. The pectorals on the sides are the only soft fins that aren't a hazard. Keith Lutz fishes walleye and largemouth and smallmouth bass most of the year, except in May, when he'll catch and release up to 300 white bass in a day, just for practice. Good eating size fish. Yeah. Now, out in the bay later in the summer, were they still as white like that? Yep, they, they don't, they, they really don't, don't change color at all. For but, spawning or anything? Uh, no, uh, they, they just get less in weight. And uh, the guys pick them up there walleye fishing. Hmm. You know, they'll troll along with hot and tots, and uh, they'll pick the fish up out there. And you say they, they weigh less later after, in the year? Oh, yeah. After they, they spawn? They, yeah, this one here, she's got some eggs in her right here. And once she drops her eggs, she'll just flatten right out. You'll, you hmm. can see how, how thin the fish is up in here, and mm -hmm. that's just about how thin they get. They, they just lose all their body weight. And this is about the only time you can really catch the big, you know. The heavier fish. ones. Yeah, the heavy fish. There we go. It's among the fastest action in the world of fishing, a springtime ritual on their spawning rivers. Not bad on the table either, the scrappy little white bass. Captain Tom Irwin of Muskegon caught this 30 and a quarter inch walleye at one o'clock in the morning, trolling a threadfin shad in Muskegon Lake. And here's a shot of Sam Mendel of Elmont and his 16 and a half pound steelhead he caught trolling a miller spoon near Manistee. Young nine-year-old Mark Bowlby of Ortonville caught a 14 and a half inch crappie that weighed a pound three quarters. 14-year-old Donald Callender of Bay City called in a dandy gobbler and had an eight and a quarter inch beard. And look at this 12-point Allegan County buck that Tony Mitchell of Otsego took with his bow during the rut. Here's another 12-pointer that Mike McPherson of Central Lake got on opening day of the firearm deer season in Sheboygan County. And what a buck this is. It's a 13-pointer. Marty Sheridan of Saginaw tagged it using a muzzleloader in Saginaw County. Ray Buell of Ravenna really didn't expect this fish when he caught it still fishing a nightcrawler in the middle of the day. I was fishing really for uh, bluegills, a couple feet off the bottom. And I think it was due to the hot weather that the bullheads were coming off the bottom because I never expected to get anything like that. I mean, this was at noon time. Yeah, noon. Most people usually fish them at night. I've never even caught one before, but. So how'd you take it off the, how'd you unhook it? Uh, carefully. Well, that, you never caught a bullhead, and you got yourself a trophy with one pound, five ounces. Congratulations, Ray Buell. Catching a one pound, five ounce bullhead makes you our Michigan Outdoors Trophy Angler of the Week. Bacterial kidney disease has been determined to be the cause of death in several thousand Lake Michigan salmon this spring. Biologists say they're not sure what triggered the disease. The losses appear to be less than last year's 7 to 10,000. 
DNR Law Division will have to sort through literally tons of prospective new conservation officers. There are currently 10,000 qualified applicants. Approximately 10 will get the jobs. Mute swan complaints are already starting to come into the DNR. The swans are very territorial, and they've already attacked boats and skiers in metropolitan area lakes. Representative Tom Alley has introduced a bill to let the governor appoint the DNR director. The Natural Resources Commission appoints a director under current law. And a season on coyotes is being considered. Under the new Wildlife Conservation Act passed last year, the DNR can set most hunting seasons and is looking at one on coyotes. Two conservation officers got surprised when they set out a turkey decoy in an effort to stop a problem with road hunters. Now, not a single poacher stopped to shoot the decoy, but two male turkeys did knock it off its stand trying to mate with it. I spent the opening day of the walleye season fishing with a professional walleye fisherman, nice guy too. I really enjoyed the day, but he spoke a completely different language. For instance, when the walleyes weren't biting, they were in a negative feeding mode. Now, I was using an old-fashioned lead-headed jig with a hunk of crawler. He was using a 1 ounce jig with a lightly hooked crawler in order to make a, get this, downstream dragging presentation. And when we were jigging right underneath the boat, we were, according to the pro, using a vertical jigging and slipping technique developed by some walleye guru from somewhere in the Midwest. Now, we caught plenty of fish using our 100% linear graphite rods, but the best part of the trip, well, that came while we were finding fish in a negative feeding mode. A kid on shore was slipping his fifth walleye onto the stringer. Just an average kid using a $10 rod and reel, a Zebco brand and worms, without even understanding the language. The kid was as good or better than the pros that day. It's a great equalizer, this activity we call fishing. Although owls have eyes in the front of their heads, like humans, there's one main difference in their ability to focus. What is it? Humans can move their eyes to look around without moving their heads. Owls cannot move their eyes in their sockets, so when an owl follows a moving object, it must move its head. Remember the caribou I finally got up in Quebec? One of the heads, a big cow, has been mounted and is on display at our museum at Houghton Lake. Tim Hayes from Creative Taxidermy and Taylor mounted this caribou head at a Michigan Taxidermist Association seminar this past winter. Ear forms from Bondo were used inside the ears. The skin goes over a foam form and is held in place with a hide paste, a glue that prevents what taxidermists call drumming. When the hide dries and separates from the form in old mounts, it created an air space called drumming, and sometimes insects would move in there. A faster drying epoxy resin is used around the base of the antlers, so as the skin dries on the form and shrinks slightly, it won't pull away from the antlers. Now at our museum, we do have an old deer head mount. In fact, one I mounted nearly 25 years ago, and it's dried and shrunk and has all the problems that modern mounts don't have. Even 10 years ago, taxidermists didn't have the technology to make mounts last a lifetime, but now they do. This caribou head could very well last 100 years or more. But the Michigan Taxidermist Association has done a lot to promote not only professionalism, but the artistic side of taxidermy. The eyes of a mount, its nose and mouth, are what give the animal expression. And the good taxidermists today spend a lot of time learning these expressions and recreating them and their mounts. This is what makes taxidermy an art. The reason taxidermy has come so far, so fast, is because at the Michigan Taxidermist Association meetings, they hold seminars for each other and share ideas and techniques to improve their craft. Okay, what we do with the nose here is we'll take and get the, the back of the nose and the front of the nose lined up. We'll take all this extra nose skin and just start working it down into the nostril itself out of sight. I brought this cow caribou back to be mounted for the museum to compare it with our deer heads, deer mounts, and show what these caribou look like in the velvet, how big they are. Stop by the museum, you'll see some real art in taxidermy. I'm going to change gears now for the next few minutes. I'm going to do something I haven't done in eight years on public television. It's almost like raising the white flag. 
You know, I've been announcing the past couple weeks on the show that we're having a massive reorganization. Well, I've been getting calls about this, not really about the reorganization, but about the reasons we're reorganizing. A guy called me yesterday from Grand Ledge. His name is Tim. He said, you know, I've been a loyal member of the Outdoors Club since it started. I paid my dues on time. I've kept up. But he says, you folks have always delivered the Outdoor Digest late. And now it's almost the end of May. I don't even have my May-June Digest. And frankly, not just me, but some of my friends who are club members are tired of it. He said, we're, we're just about ready to ask for a refund. He said, can't you folks get your act together? Well, I sat back, and instead of trying to present this upbeat thing of, hey, we're, we're doing this and we're doing that, I said, Tim, I'm going to tell you the straight scoop. I'm going to tell you the straight scoop, and this goes down to something that, that you might have guessed, financial problems. Yeah, we got them on this show. And you're, you're sitting out there saying, how could we possibly have financial problems? We are the top show on public television. You viewers have called in more pledges for this program than any other program in history in Michigan. We've set the records. $330,000 in the last pledge period alone. That's phenomenal. That money primarily goes to public television stations, which they use for this Thursday night time slot airing Michigan Outdoors. That doesn't come to us for production. The way we're set up is that we need to get our money from, oh, the Outdoors Club and the Outdoor Fair and from underwriting. That's supposed to be the primary source of income for this television show. This has been the problem, the bottleneck. For eight years it's been a problem, and I'm, I'm, I'm at wit's end on this. We have a national show, which takes about six or seven hours a week to produce. It's going out to 60-some stations around the country right now. We have not been able to get that underwritten. We have two underwriters as of this moment on Michigan Outdoors. When this show concludes, we will be down to one. This is the last evening that the Chevy Value Leaders will be underwriting this show. I didn't expect this to happen. Uh, this is, has got me upset. It's been disappointing. And I can't blame the Chevy Value Leaders and all the other 50 other companies that have given us rejections in the past six months. They say the same thing. You're on public television. We can't do commercials. You can't even do a, a commercial message in the 10-second underwriting slot. And these companies say, we just can't justify putting our money into PBS when we could put it in hardcore advertising instead. So here I am, Tim, and all you other club members and people who are wondering, what's the problem here? Why don't we have the digest out on time? Because we are not funded the way we need to be. We don't have our money together even though it looks like we do. I know you people think, hey, i got to be rich. No, it isn't that way at all. So what am I going to do about this? I can't, I, I haven't totally given up on trying to get underwriting, but I am, I'm going a new direction, something I haven't done in eight years. We are going the nonprofit public service route. We have formed a nonprofit foundation. We can take in grants, which we've never been able to do before, tax-exempt contributions. We can hold raffles. We can raise money in new ways. We've got to do that to replace this underwriting loss. Also with the Digest and the club, we have got to double our membership in the Outdoors Club. I've got to go on an aggressive campaign. We'll get the D Digest out on time. We're going to get involved even with a PAC, Political Action Committee, to, to extend sportsmen's influence a little bit into politics. I mean, we have got to do new things. This, this, this method of underwriting on public television hasn't worked. I'm disappointed, but rather than fight it and, and maybe take this whole show down because we can't survive, I'm going the new direction. So I'm asking Tim, I'm asking his buddies, I'm asking you to stick with us a few more months. We're changing dramatically. I hope uh, you thank the Stroh Brewery and all the people who have underwritten and continue to support us. But we're going new directions, and it had better work. Financial problems has been at the bottom of it, you might have guessed. I hope we get these solved real soon. We need to. So that's the message. It's, uh, I've kind of been hiding it from you. You know, when you're in business, you want to portray this image that, hey, everything's fine. We're building a new building. We're, you know, everything's great. <laughs> everything's great except the money. And it seems to be getting tougher. But we're going to crack it. And you'll help, I know. Now let's sort of maybe get a little more upbeat now and dig into a great recipe. 
Chuck Johns has sent us a different type of recipe, a salmon rice loaf. Mm. be perfect for company because everything goes all in one dish, basically. Oh, boy, look at that <laughs> salmon. That's as good as looking salmon as you'll ever find. That's right. You're going to trim that. Just get that little bit of fat off there. You want to boil your salmon. And you could use leftover salmon if there is such a thing. Oh, and the salmon. Yeah, I see That's it's right. In the bottom of That's that bowl right. right there. And then you're going to add minute rice and a couple of eggs and some fresh parsley, a little bit of onion powder, powder a little bit of garlic powder, some salt and pepper. And really make just an excellent rice loaf here. And this is evaporated milk and butter. And you're going to pour that on. Hmm. And then that all goes into the oven. It, you know, it, it sounds tasty. I'm not sure why, but it, <laughs> it just sounds very good. And then that goes into a butter dish and you bake that. And then you put on a cheese sauce over the top of that when it comes out. It's got mustard, dry mustard, hmm. and your evaporated milk. Hold up, dry mustard. Could you use regular uh, squeeze? You could, but you only want to use just a little tiny bit, and this dry mustard really does have a different flavor. Hmm. And then cubed Velveeta cheese, and then some of your cheddar cheese. And you just want to melt that all together, and that really makes an excellent sauce for this hmm. salmon rice loaf. So that sauce goes on top of the loaf that's right. in the oven. as you serve it. Yep. Hmm. I'll and be darned. you got to flip. Oh, yep, you got to invert it. I remember when you did that. <laughs> As I recall, Bob Garner wasn't all too wild about the sounds of this dish. I thought whoever made it was nuts. <laughs> <laughs> now, wait a minute. No, I, well, I, I know, Kef, but you know what I'm saying. Anytime you take, a, you take a glob of rice and you've got salmon in it and a bunch of cheese, so I wasn't sold on it at all. I don't particularly like all those ingredients blended together, but... Boy, you hit this stuff with a with a dollop of that cheese sauce, mm. and if you could throw some uh, some jalapenos in this, spice it up, holy cats! <laughs> Even without it, mm -hmm. I bet you you know kids would love this. Oh yeah, oh, yeah absolutely. Because kids like you know chips and it's nachos and all that. Oh, it's terrific! You don't have quite enough salmon to go around. My kid would make to, it go a long ways. My kid would have to be doggone fast to get a second help into this <laughs> stuff. I'll tell you that. I imagine he is doggone fast right now. <laughs> yeah, he He's <is>. learned. <laughs> he is. The recipe for salmon rice loaf, along with all of our May-June recipes, are in the Outdoor Digest magazine. If you'd like a free copy, along with information on joining the Outdoors Club and becoming a part of what's going to be an important new movement for sportsmen in Michigan, all you have to do is drop me a line at Box 1775, East Lansing, Michigan, 48826. We'll send you a digest and all the information. Our guide reports have a... Well, a better morel mushroom report than we've had in the past, starting in the south, the last of the white morels. is marching northward. They're coming on in the northern part of the lower peninsula. Some spots need rain. Say lots of them around Presqu'ile County. Up in the upper peninsula on the west side, they need one more rain to really make them pop around Bay Danak. They say they're easy to find. What about Manuskong Bay? Oh, come on. Harry's Place says the fishing is too good to take time to look for mushrooms. They are getting limits of walleye. Catfish all you want. On the western side of the UP, they're getting three to four walleye pike limits, according to Dick Blau at Dick's Favorite Sports in the Keweenaw. Jumbo perch in Lake Gogibic. I mean, some big ones up to a pound and a half. Black flies, however, are thick in some parts of the North Country. Getting laker limits, limits of lake trout in different parts around the Great Lakes, uh, but they're getting mixed bags of browns, kings, lakers, steelhead off of Pentwater. But limits in the southwest, according to Captain Don Nichols at South Haven, limits of coho, limits of lake trout, limits of perch, and the brown trout off of the piers has been the best ever. Houghton Lake, walleye limits, as well as plenty of bluegills, crappie, and pike are getting a couple of walleye off Oscoda, but look at the size, five to six pounders. A couple of walleye, Saginaw Bay. Down here in Detroit River, where we fished a couple weeks ago, Wyandotte Bait and Tackle says they're getting one to two walleye and white bass. You can get uh, a whole limit in 20 minutes. So bass prospects for this weekend are excellent we're going to be out on opening day we'll report on that next week so get outdoors if you can it's a great place to be next week on michigan outdoors we'll take on the challenge of opening day of bass season and once again we have an absolutely perfect lake it appears there's no way we can possibly come back with anything but an absolutely stellar story you know the kind of lake we've done lots of stories with guides who take us to places that are sure things places where i've managed to get skunked but things really do look good for this opener. Famous last words. I know you have a busy summer coming up, but try to set aside a half hour for Michigan Outdoors next week. Same time, same station, right here on public television.
Hi there, I'm Fred Trost inviting you to join me this week for the opening day of bass season. Given some halfway decent weather, we'll have some great action. We'll take a look at the winners in the Michigan Taxidermist Association's 1989 competition and a lot more. So join me for Michigan Outdoors this week right here on public television.